In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The text is the gospel which you heard read from Luke chapter 15, especially the 30th, the 20th verse. But he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Your heavenly Father's love for you and all his sons and daughters is irrepressible. Every man, woman, and child was created by him and redeemed by Christ, whether they know it or not. And every baptized child, including little Henry Alexander, is adopted by our Heavenly Father as his child. That child may rebel, may deny his adoption into his family. He may run off away from the Lord. He may deny that he is part of the family of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He may tell the Father and the Father's other sons and daughters to get lost. Leave me alone. I'm not yours anymore. Ah, but that doesn't stop the Father's love. He still wants that child. Running away doesn't change the status of a child with the child's father. Admittedly, a child could be a lost child, a rebellious child, an ungrateful child, but the child, from the father's point of view, is still my child. And if a son changed his name to reject his father, the fa in the father's mind, that son is still my son. The son cannot stop the father's grace. And we see that grace in action. The father runs. He sees his lost son on the horizon because he's been always watching for his lost son's return. And the instant he sees him, he's got hurts for his son out of compassion for his starving, pitiful state. The father cannot help himself. He does what was unthinkable for a Middle Eastern father to do. He runs, really shaming himself, his robes flopping around, making a mess. His servants see him do this. No doubt they clucked their tongues at this humiliating display. No doubt some who were better parents were saying, hey, dad, chill out, slow down. Make this son come to you. You're making it too easy. You're a pushover. The kid wished you dead, took the inheritance you get if you keeled over, liquidated it at fire sale prices, pennies on the dollar, and wasted it all. Make him shamefully walk home. Make him walk down the long road through the servants' housing, let them spit at him and jeer him and mock him and roll their eyes at him. Of course he's coming home. He blew it all just like we knew he would. Make him growl. Or better yet, ignore him completely. From this wasteful, son, waste, wasteful son's side of things, I think it's pretty similar to what the servants are thinking. He knows he blew it. He knows that it was wrong to beg dad to give him the inheritance and then sell it off and then waste it in such a foolish way. Of course, the famine was a powerful tool to bring him to the end of himself. And that, uh, what, slopping pigs for a Jewish boy, it doesn't get much lower than that. Some think that the turning point in this parable is the line when he came to himself. And perhaps that is the point. It is from that point on that he talks about my father. He must be remembering what a gracious dad he has. But there's still that self-righteous plan, his scheme to fix things, to pay back the debt, to undo the past. He thinks to himself, my sermon, my father's servants have 
make enough to have bread and to spare, which means you could put some money in the bank, I could do that, and, and eventually I could pay off the debt. He can earn his way back. The audience of those angry at Jesus for eating with sinners, oh, they would be loving this point in the parable. Finally, Jesus is talking some sense here. Make them earn it back. Yes, that's it. Pay off the debt by hard work. Now, to be sure, that's the way the world really works. But friends, this parable isn't how the world works and it isn't about estate planning and hard work or how you ought to run your families. It's about the kingdom of God. And your father's kingdom is upside down from everything else you know in life. Thanks be to God. So the wasteful son prepares, propels his weary bag of bones down the dusty road home with a plan. I'm going to have to swallow my pride a bit, but I'll pay it off. It's all good. But then he really gets pulled over. For just as he was bracing himself to walk through the gauntlet of servants who despise him for dishonoring his father, what he never expected, could never demand, and had never earned grows in his drained eyes. Is this a mirage? Is it? Is that my dad running, running to me? Running with a smile and not a fist or a sword. And here is the real turning point, for in the father's extravagant love, the son fully sees how full the shame and debt is that he incurred. It isn't just about paying back half an estate. I've shamed and dishonored my dad. I can't repay that. But my dad is running. He's covering the shame and dishonor. He really loves me. You can tell there's a major change there. For the son changes his planned speech from the original version as he lops off that little treat me like one of your hired servants. He says this truncated one, Father. I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. There's no repayment plan because he knows he could never pay it, ever. Now, dearly beloved, you know who you are in this gospel, don't you? Our Father has given us everything we have, all because we're his kids. Everything, our body and soul, eyes, ears, and all our members, our reason and senses. He's given you every moment in your life, every breath, the air that fills your lungs, the food that nourishes your body, the drinks that make glad the heart of men, clothes, shoes, parents, children, house, home, work, everything. And we've wasted all of it in sinful living. In fact, there hasn't been a day when you haven't used the beautiful gifts of your Heavenly Father in sin. In effect, you've been wishing God dead, running away from home, blowing it all on empty, foolish, vain living, which is really dying. And what's your Father's answer? He chases after you. He sends his only begotten son to pay the full debt, including the shame and dishonor. That's why he hangs high on Golgotha, stripped bare. He takes what we deserve. He let them spit at him and jeer and roll their eyes at him, mock him, as if Jesus blew it all just like they knew he would. And there... The father ignored Jesus completely because that's the damnation I deserve and that you deserve. Jesus was stripped so that we could be clothed with the best righteousness, the best garment, his righteousness given in holy baptism. Jesus was disowned so that we could get the family ring put on our finger. That was, by the way, the ancient credit card 
Would you give that to your son who just blew half your estate? But the Father lets us charge our sins to Jesus' account and even enables us to forgive others from Jesus' completed work. And the fattened calf, the feast, ah, that's the best of meats and finest of wines and the very body and blood of Jesus given and shed for you. Now know this, the feast at the Father's house was not for the prodigal son. It is to honor the Father's great love and joy at finding his son. Like the other two parables in Luke 15, the shepherd has a party to celebrate his found sheep, the woman for her lost, now found coin. I don't think a coin or a sheep could care less that there's a party going on. The feast here is not in your honor or mine. It's thrown by our Heavenly Father because he and all heaven rejoices to find sinners repenting and coming home like little Henry Alexander, like you. Your father really delights to be with you as you let him be your father who loves you, who fixes the messes you made and shows you real forgiveness, salvation, and joy and life in Christ. Oh yes, there's that other son who clearly thinks he's been earning dad's favor by putting up with the old man. He doesn't want to eat with sinners like his rotten little brother. He doesn't want to honor his father by receiving his generous love. He's been going to church thinking that he's doing God a favor. God must be impressed that I'm here to worship him. How upside down. The father has every right to write off this ungrateful, self-righteous kid. But instead, he goes chasing after him, too. I love you, son. Everything I have is yours. Come on. Let's rejoice together. I want you at my table, too, because you need to be saved just as much as your brother. And so we are. Here we are, friends. The runaways and the self-righteous not one of us worthy of this father, but still he comes to welcome you at this feast in which his son will feed you, comfort you, and welcome you as his brothers and sisters. And he wants this invitation to go to all he's created. The complaint against Jesus at the beginning of Luke 15 was, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Well, thanks be to God, he's doing that again today. Thanks be to God, in Jesus' name. Amen. The peace of God which passes all our understanding. Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting.